find a way to manage your stress. There, there's enough angst in the world right now with the pandemic, the economic crisis. Add in if you're, you know, thinking about how you're going to sell your business. You know, you can really just you know, uh, drive yourself mad. And so, whether it's you know meditation, yoga, podcasts, uh, you know, finding some. Although you know, as much as uh, tech talks is is must must listen uh, podcasting. <laughs> On today's show, we're talking to Aaron Goldman, the Chief Marketing Officer at Media Ocean, and we're hopping over to the greater Chicago area to have him join the podcast. So it's great to go stateside for the show. And we're talking all about culture and how to capture some of those organic conversations that are so much harder to come by now we're all isolated. This is Tech Talks, your twice-weekly technology podcast with myself, David Savage, today joined by Hayley Welch, where we talk to leaders from across the industry and bring you some technology news. Welcome to today's show. It's Friday. Well, it's not Friday as we're recording. It's Thursday. But uh, hey, uh, as this interview discusses, I think there is uh, there's no hump day anymore. So does it matter if it's Thursday or Friday, Hayley? No, every day is a Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Every day, for Friday. not quite, but you know, I kind, of, I kind of like. Look, obviously, we will get to the interview in a minute, but Aaron, our guest, talks about the fact that, as far as he's concerned, um, there is no hump day, right? Mm. And I kind of wonder. To me, everything feels like a Thursday. Does it? Yeah, because you kind of don't have to get up to go anywhere. True. It's not like you've got to get into the office. It has that slightly more relaxed feel that I guess a Friday in the office had, mm. but you've still got stuff to do and it's never quite Friday because you never quite have the payoff of the weekend. Yeah, you're never really like excited for the weekend, especially in actual lockdown. Like when it was, was a little bit like more lax, you'd be like, woohoo, weekend, we can go see some people. Yeah. And then now it's like, oh, well, yeah. so, so we're just sitting at the same table, <laughs> the same living room. <laughs> Well, exactly. This is it. So I, I never feel like there's a there's a hump to the week because I, d I don't feel like Monday is Monday. I don't have that kind of like, oh, God, got to get up, got to get into work. Um, Tuesdays were my worst day. Yeah. I used to hate Tuesdays. But then by the time it's Wednesday, I'm like, well, Thursday, Friday, it's nearly the end of the week. Exactly. And the week's, weeks are going by like that. Yeah, yeah. No, it's they are going fast. Life. Well, I can't believe it's only Christmas. Can't complain. Well, it's like, I know, I, this year I've actually thought, oh my God, it's gone so fast. Before I know it, I'm going to be popping kids out. I need I need <laughs> another year to like have some fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, well, there are going to be a lot of kids, I imagine, around about spring next year. Not from me, guys, not from me. Not from you. All right, there you go, not from me. <laughs> right, with that, with that, Revealing insight. Let's head to the interview. Um, our guest is Aaron. He's the Chief Marketing Officer at Media Ocean. We'll hand over to that interview. When we come back, we'll have a bit of commentary and some technology news. So today we're talking to Aaron Goldman. Aaron, you are the Chief Marketing Officer at Media Ocean. Reasonably new to that business as well. Thanks for for spending some time and, and uh, taking some time out your day to talk to us on the podcast. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. How is your day going? The day is going well. Uh, it's a little earlier in the day here uh, in the States. I'm uh, based just north of Chicago. So yep. I'm speaking to you. You're uh, six hours ahead in the future. You tell me, how, how is the day going? What's uh, what's in store? Uh, well, it, it, it's brightened up as it's gone on. So that's that's something to look forward to. <laughs> no, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. Wednesdays are, it always felt like that middle kind of part of the week, right? And Wednesdays now feel a bit more like a progressed part of the week than they used to, yes. which I think says more about my productivity levels on a Friday than anything. Yes. It, uh, we, we refer to Wednesday. We used to refer to Wednesday as hump day. Um, you know, the, the hump in the middle of the week, although now it just feels like every day is hump day, I suppose. Yeah. It's a little bit like that, isn't it? Bit random. There we go. Anyway, look, um, media ocean. Uh, we mentioned there that you are reasonably new to media ocean. Um, who are media ocean as a business? Yeah, so Media Ocean uh, is a business that's actually been around for more than 50 years. Uh, it Basically, we provide the software backbone for the advertising industry. And so uh, companies will use our software to help plan, buy, and measure advertising across everything from uh, television to now you know, streaming and digital, 
uh, to the apps on your phone. And I joined the company by way of acquisition. Um, so in the uh, at the end of July, the company that I was a part of called 4C was acquired by MediaOcean. And 4C, I had been a part of that company for five years. And similar uh, complementary businesses, also in the advertising space, building software, uh, helping advertisers create and manage their programs. Um, but 4C was focused on what we call closed ecosystems. So places like Google, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Snap, even Amazon, uh, these uh, environments where there's people more and more, especially these days, uh, spending a lot of time and um, for businesses that want to connect with people in those environments, we had a platform that enabled that. And so now you build that into MediaOcean's business and we've just got pipes into all the places where uh, businesses can can reach consumers and, and hopefully move them to action uh, at, at a time when it's it's sorely needed. And look, how how has that process been? You know, you mentioned there that uh, you were at 4C. 4C uh, were acquired by MediaOcean. That's got to be an interesting thing to go through during the middle of everything else that we're going through, right? Most organizations are figuring out how to survive in this new world, never mind going through that added process piece of transformation on top. Yeah, indeed. It was um, certainly uh, strange and, and surreal. I mean, the, the process of, uh, from the kind of initial conversations around the acquisition to the actual closing of the deal all happened end to end during lockdown. So there were no physical meetings uh, between the companies. Uh, everything, you know, of course, we've all gotten quite uh, pr proficient at this uh, video conference format. And so we held a series of meetings, you know, starting from just initial business meetings and, and seeing if there was a good fit, then moving into kind of the diligence phase and financials and what were sometimes, you know, multiple, multiple hour meetings, in some cases, all day meetings uh, between people just kind of going through various uh, bit aspects of the business. In a way, I think it actually might have been helped that we were in this period because, there were no distractions. Uh, no one was taking holidays. There was, you know, it's, it, it wasn't very hard to coordinate everybody's diaries. We were all there and, and, and ready. So uh, we were able to really focus and, and get it done. But, you know, so much of, of any business uh, really is about the, the relationships. And so to cultivate those in this remote environment uh, cer certainly was a, a bit different. I, I do think it helped that you know, we had kind of the businesses had known each other previously, some of the key principles. There had been some relationships established. Actually, the CEO of MediaOcean, uh, Bill Wise, is someone I've known personally for 20 years. So there was some trust coming in, uh, but to, to work through a process and, and to think about, too, you know, when you're in financial diligence and you're trying to talk about, you know, how your revenues are looking and what you're forecasting looking ahead while there's so much uncertainty around you adds an extra element uh, to, to the process that. Uh, ultimately, when you know, when, when you think about, and, and this is you know probably something that uh, I'd imagine any business, whether you're you know being acquired, acquiring someone else, or just you know just trying to stay in business and stay afloat uh, during these times, I think keeping the focus on the customer is always you know always the best the best practice. And so, yes, we were working through all these things, but at the end of the day, it was a good fit because we provided solutions that our customers found value in. And as long as we were continuing to deliver, we had confidence that the process would, would complete and have a successful outcome. Just out of interest, what, what was that conversation like with customers of 4C when you're being acquired by MediaOcean? You know, you, you, you've got to keep your, you know, part of the reason that you're being bought is that customer base, right? And that, that loyalty of those customers to your business. But during a pandemic to then see that you're being acquired, that, that may spook some people. So I suppose that that is a conversation that you've got to have to say, Look, you're still going to get the same great service and actually it's beneficial to you for these reasons so that yeah. that must have been an interesting different myriad of conversations to have at that time as well yeah that, that's exactly right though that, that was the talk track it was it was the idea of um first and foremost now there's there's a, a level of stability media ocean a very large company been established been around for 50 years um, it's, it's been foundational to the advertising industry. So there's good awareness. And so when people heard, whether it was, you know, through the press or with uh, us actually calling and, and, and talking to our customers, when they heard that this was happening, it, there was some level of familiarity and almost a reassurance. Okay, this is great. Now 4C is going to you know, have a long-term place as part of this advertising backbone. Uh, and so it 
it was a relatively easy conversation. Then when we said in, you know, the product that you've been using and the team that you've been working with are going to continue to stay in place. Uh, of course, that that helps. And um, because so much of the attention of our customers right now is on, you know, um, keeping their business running, delivering for their customers, right? Because our, our customers are essentially um, marketers, marketeers within larger organizations. And they're thinking about how they are going to deliver value to their customers and the places where they're doing that, going back to a Google, a Facebook, a Twitter, these type of environments, they need uh, as much as, as, as ever a, f- a focus, an ability, a, a software that can help them in an automated fashion, reach the, the best people with, with the right message. And so when they thought about, okay, I still get that from 4C, plus now it's it's connected into this vast media ocean. I'm, I'm enjoying my maritime metaphors uh, here, but you know, as, as you, you take what we had and, and, and put it into this larger environment, and now you begin to see other ways that you can unlock further value. So it actually was a relatively easy discussion, uh, albeit one that, again, is always a little awkward when you're doing it over uh, uh, a Zoom or now in our case, we're, we're getting used to um, Microsoft Teams. Yeah. Yeah. Look, out of interest as well, with regards to the business itself, and I suppose how successfully that's going, I'd imagine there's a huge amount of interest right now because lots of organizations have suddenly gone from that position where they can get in front of people physically to not being able to. So digital channels were suddenly flooded with marketing information. Uh, and you mentioned automated uh, marketing there, but I suppose after that initial rush, there were some accusations of organizations that were possibly tone deaf and weren't getting it quite right. And and how have your customers then scaled back to working out what's important to them and, and what's that process been like? Yeah, I, I suppose the blessing and the curse of this sort of digital format is that you can um, change things quickly. Uh, at, at, so, so you can put a message in market, you can see... Instantly, you can get feedback. Are people engaging with it? Do they like it? Do they retweet it? Uh, if they comment on it, is it positive or negative sentiment? And so you can analyze very quickly what type of, of messages are resonating with people, and then you can make adjustments. Now, the blessing, of course, is that you can start to see: all right, did this message land? What did it? You know, did they see it as tone deaf, and then maybe I need to adjust, or maybe it was. Um, to on tone and people are starting to get sick of the we're here for you message, you know, in these unprecedented times in in the amount people want to stop being reminded about that. And they want to go back to their, you know, aspirational, like take me to the beach. You know, even if I I, I can't go, I at least want to see that imagery to take my mind off of the situation at hand. And so the vacillation between uh, what works and what doesn't, you can get that instant feedback and adjust. Of course, the the curse of this, and you start to see this, uh, Maybe less so in marketing and advertising, but if you look at uh, you know politics or entertainment and what some people are calling kind of cancel culture, you know a single tweet uh, can end your career. Uh, and, and so while that instant kind of ability to send a message and see how it goes, if you go too far over the line, there may be no coming back from it. Mm. Now, one thing that I suppose is very interesting is how you bring two organizations together when you can't physically get together. Uh, looking behind you, you've got Meteor Ocean paraphernalia on your door behind you. You've got a, a fish tank that uh, is 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 in the court. Well, not a, not a physical fish tank, but a screensaver of fish tank in, in the corner of the room. You've got a singing fish. Um, you, you know, you've, you've gone all out to, to try and make sure that your working environment feels, I suppose, like it's branded. You're a marketing manager. That's that's probably second nature to you. It might not be second nature, I suppose, to everybody within your organization. So how have you helped them feel like they're part of something new or different? Yeah, uh, well, one aspect of that um, really is about trying to blend the cultures together uh, between the companies and create, not like take one culture and instill it into the other, but really create a blend of, of, of a new culture as we go forward. And a lot of that comes in these initial phases, just through the act of getting to know each other. And as you mentioned, that that is hard to do when we're all on lockdown and and working remote. You don't have these moments where you can just gather, you know, in the uh, kitchen or, you know, outside the, in the halls and, and have a conversation. Everything is scheduled. If you want to talk to someone, you put it on the diary. And, and so you don't have those chance encounters that sometimes help build, 
the rapport and establish a culture organically. So we have to be a little more intentional about it. But what we've tried to do is be intentionally unintentional. And so I don't know if you can see next to uh, the fake fish tank, I've got a water cooler. Yes. And, you know, the water cooler is like the symbol of office culture. It's the, you know, the spot where people kind of gather around and, you know, they talk about uh, their, uh, you know, what happened over the weekend or, you know, it's just, it's this, it's this um, archetype. And so what we've done actually is I'm hosting water cooler sessions where I will, yes, I have to be intentional about it. So I'll schedule time with people, but I'll schedule a, a meeting at the water cooler. And then we'll just talk about whatever, you know, we want to talk about some business topics, some just personal get to know you. And what I've been doing with, with people's permission, of course, is recording those sessions and posting them on our internal uh, intranet. And it's a way for people to start to see, I, I'm, I'm picking people in uh, different off, uh, uh, locations, different regions, Media Ocean's a global company. And so uh, earlier this week, I was on with someone uh, in um, Amsterdam. Uh, I've done them with folks in London, Singapore, uh, across the US. And it's this idea of showing how, you know, it's, uh, how we're staying connected and I'm trying to bring out elements in the conversation. We're talking about like, how is the integration of the companies going? What are some of your key priorities? And so it's a chance to like overhear a water cooler conversation that you might've actually done if you were in the office. And it just helps, you know, foster some of that sense of community and connectedness. Out of interest, have you thought about doing it so that you're just you have an open slot in your diary for someone just to join randomly rather than schedule an individual? I have not done that, but that's a great idea. I will I will implement that. <laughs> uh, I, I, I um, I'll have to, you know I've I've been careful about because I'm recording them and we have limited yeah. bandwidth in the house and I've got three kids who are um, e learning uh, at school. <laughs> And so there's always a, a fight over the uh, internet and they know when, uh, when daddy's doing a water cooler, uh, they need to um, um, get, uh, allow me to have the best of the bandwidth. So they move to the outer parts of the house. But I suppose, <laughs> yes, if I were to schedule just a, 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 a block every day and people could drop in, uh, I think that would work quite well. So thanks, Dave. I'm going to have to put that in play. It's interesting how you're having to negotiate with your family over bandwidth. I suppose that's something that so many people must have to relate to now. Well, yes, and and uh, it is. You know, there, there's it, 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 there's trade offs. You know, it's uh, there's the difference between each of my kids' programs too. Is um, my my oldest child just gets all of her assignments at the beginning of the day, and then she can do them at her leisure. You know, and she just has to submit them at the end of the day. My younger two kids follow uh, essentially a bell schedule. And so, you know, 30, 40 minute class periods that they have to be present for. And so they're old enough to be able to handle that without me looking over their shoulder, but too young to be able to handle like a shared family diary where we would book appointments and, you know, be able to manage all that. So we're somewhere in between like passing notes under the door, you know, Hey, can I come in? No. And, uh, and I, I, I think uh, ultimately it's brought a um, the idea of parenting through the the pandemic has changed in, in so many different ways. Um, but the I got to tell you the power I feel because on my um, through my internet account I've got the kill switch and I can <laughs> see every device. And if I needed to, don't test me, little one, because I can take you down with a push of this button. <laughs> um, usually that threat is. Uh, it, it works better when it's after school hours and they're doing, you know, gaming or, or YouTube or TikTok. But yeah. uh, I, I, uh, I, I do relish the fact that I always have something that I can hang over them. <laughs> so, look, as, as, a, as a quick last point, um, you know, you've obviously gone through a successful acquisition during this, this period in time. If an organization's strategy was to look to get acquired and now we find ourselves in a world of reduced budgets and more caution, how would you how would you suggest they go about that? Yeah, I, well, I think first and foremost, I, I'd go back to the point that the best thing you can do for your business at any time is just to keep creating value for your customers. Uh, that's the thing. You know, any business that might acquire you is going to do it because they see that you are delivering value and they want to be able to further enable that. Um, the Second, I would say, is uh, also something that, that we had the benefit of was, was trusted relationships. Even though the process from start to finish of the acquisition all happened remotely during lockdown, it drew on trust, partnerships, relationships that 
predated the, the pandemic. And so now's not a time for uh, cold calling, cold meetings, you know, trying to, um, you know, sort of virtually network your way into someone who might want to buy your business. Go back to your trusted relationships, people that um, can vouch for you and maybe connect you to someone who might be in a position to um, uh, make, make some sort of suitable offer. I'd say also really important, and we touched on this when it comes to communications, is don't forget about your staff and your employees. It can, you know, oftentimes during these processes, an executive team may, you know, have to disappear for weeks at a time working through diligence. Uh, and if you, you know, your, your people, your staff will pick up on that. Even though we're all remote, you can still kind of feel when someone's not really uh, around and available and accessible. So going out of your way to, to uh, make sure that your staff is, uh, is, you know, maybe there's certain things you can't share with them and, and the level of detail of where you're at in the process, but making sure that you are communicating and you're attentive to their needs. And then I'd say the last uh, from, from um, just a, a, a personal standpoint is find a way to manage your stress. There, there's enough angst in the world right now with the pandemic, the economic crisis. Add in, if you're, you know, thinking about how you're going to sell your business, you know, you can really just you know, um, drive yourself mad. And so whether it's, you know, meditation, yoga, podcasts, uh, you know, finding some, although, you know, as much as uh, Tech Talks is, is must must listen uh, podcasting. <laughs> I may recommend something that might take your mind off of business for a little bit. Uh, if you're yeah, no, to... look, most of my podcasts are not that I listen to are nothing to do with tech or work. Yeah, uh, but just finding you know something that can help bring balance so that you can be present again for your staff, for your family, and most importantly for yourself. Okay, put you on the spot. Recommend one podcast that's got nothing to do with work. Uh, I have been uh, listening to. Uh, a good mix of fiction and nonfiction. And so I'll, I'll pick one from uh, either side. Uh, on the nonfiction side, uh, I listen to The Daily uh, by the New York Times uh, yep. e each day. It's about 20, 30 minutes and they tackle one particular topic. Um, it helps me keep current, gives me some talking points uh, to drop into conversations the rest of the day to make it sound like I'm, you know, um, well in the loop on on what's happening in the world and uh let's see on the fiction side i've been listening to a lot of those like crime um you know serial podcasts uh let me think of which was the one that i saw most recently you don't mind if i consult my phone do you absolutely not Oh, this one was fun. Dirty John. Uh, this is a couple of years old. I actually think they made it into a TV series. Oh, and yeah. actually, now that I think about it, uh, that's not fiction at all. That was based on a true story. Yeah, yeah that was a true story. But uh, yeah, yeah that's, I think there's a show on Netflix, isn't there? Yeah. But yeah. at any rate, certainly took my mind off of uh, the trite problems of you know um, advertising campaigns uh, and uh, uh, reminded me that there are bigger problems uh, out in the world. So it's all, well, all look, perspective. Aaron, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. I hope that uh, the role continues to go well in your slightly new surroundings and uh, uh, pleased that you're able to spare some time to talk to us on the show. Thanks for having me, Dan. Right. It, it feels like the right time to have a, a podcast where software for advertising is at its heart because Black Friday is coming up. So um, as I understand from my wife, everything is already selling out. Really? Yeah, apparently people are getting in properly early this year. So there's lots yeah. of money off already. And um, yeah, I mean, have you not noticed like Instagram is just like it was It was adverts constantly in the beginning, but there are just adverts yeah. nonstop. Yeah, it is constant. I think um, there's a lot of spending going into that, definitely. Because like every every other post I scroll up, I'm like, oh, another ad, another ad, another ad, another ad. Even I'm getting ads out on there at the moment. <laughs> what do you think about this notion of a single tweet can end your career? And it's kind of like that, I, say, I suppose not just tweet, but post. In terms of trying to get the tightrope right between engaging with an audience, especially in an advertising setting. And we both know this from side hustles, right? You know, you're trying to get something that you're doing, mm. a passion project in front of people. You're trying to grab attention. You're trying to find an audience. But if you're tone deaf or you say the wrong thing, you could very quickly turn that community off against you. 
Yeah, and no, I definitely I've seen an, an example of it recently, actually, where, you know, people are advertising things and it's getting taken the wrong way. And then people then people just instantly have a, an opinion or a judgment of the company or the business. So it's, it's a very fine line, actually, to, to, with, what, with what you're doing and how people perceive you, um, especially if you are trying to be like quite like a young and trendy brand. Everyone's kind of like, like it's, it's sad, isn't it, really, when you think about it? Um, yeah, so it's difficult, isn't it? Because you want you want an influencer who is authentic and actually believes in your product. But it's difficult to get that when you're an unknown product. Definitely. And this is the thing with influencers. It's a bit of like, no one really trusts what they say anymore. Because if it's an ad, they're getting paid for it. They've got something free for it. So getting a real honest review now is really, really difficult. You need your own personal consumers who purchase the products to give you a review. Um, but then that market is just not as big as the influencer market, you know. So yeah, it's difficult. I, I'm personally struggling with that at the moment. Um, getting people like if I went and sent it out to something out to a big celebrity and then they post they have to say it's an ad which is good in some respects because as the purchaser um there was I think like this how we lot were advertising teeth whitening and they've all got veneers <laughs> so they were posting pictures with these like lights in their oh, mouth no. and they've all got veneers and I was like well, but people were buying into that. This is when it was like at the beginning of like that when when that was huge. Yeah. Or like that charcoal toothpaste. Oh, do you know what God. I mean? So But that's I suppose where micro influencing has become, you know, important. Like people who have maybe a couple of thousand followers, but in a really yeah, specific right. area. And if they if they genuinely like what you've got, mm -hmm. then that's far more powerful and can 100%. act as a really strong advocate. So it's an interesting area uh, to talk about generally. However, one other thing I wanted to talk about, um, was around culture because Aaron is obviously bringing two cultures together and I found it quite interesting that he was doing unintent sorry intentionally unintentional water conversation water cooler conversations and recording them and then posting them on the internet so that people could literally eavesdrop um and I <sighs> If I think about the times that I would walk around the office and I would hear a conversation and be like, oh, that's interesting. You guys are talking about that because X, Y, and Z. That totally happened all the time, especially when people are coming in and out of meeting rooms. Mm -hmm. um, I love what Aaron's trying to do, but because it's intentionally unintentional, do you think people will open up and say things off guard in the same way? Oh, I don't know. It's so difficult, isn't it? Like the I don't know. I think it depends on what the, the culture of the actual business is like in the first place, whether people would get involved with something like that. Um, I reckon, say, if we did something like that in our business, everyone's quite social, aren't they? Kind of quite opinionated. Mm. So maybe. Um, I mean, yeah. in a way, these kind of conversations are a little bit like that. Mm, yeah, definitely. Like, imagine if someone um, jump in now and say, well, actually. Yeah, I mean, the, the, pod, the podcast... <laughs> It's often us just rambling away for a few minutes, but I'm not sure that our colleagues eavesdrop on them. Uh, other no. people do. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> not sure our colleagues do. Um, yeah, no, look, I, I find it just a whole interesting area when when they're trying to merge these two businesses together. But I think there's, there's a really interesting point in there, and especially when he was talking about um, then how you go out and you you take your message to market now's not a time for cold calling and he was talking obviously about the acquisition and finding someone to acquire your business and he's but you know now is not the time for cold calling trusted relationships connect to someone you know and it all ties in you know um if you've got a brand and you're trying to get it out there then micro influencers and people who are already in your network and who might genuinely resonate with it or family and friends can be your ad be, can be your advocates but approaching a, a massive celebrity influencer might not be the way forward if you're in sales and you're trying to get in front of people and you're trying to say buy this from me approaching someone who doesn't know you at all very hard thing to do right now but getting someone in your network to advocate you and go oh well i've used this before actually and they're really worthwhile talking to massively strong possibly more influential than it's ever been yeah. And I think that's a really interesting point that now is not the time for cold calling, but it is absolutely the time for leveraging relationships and having advocates who trust you. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I loved it when he said that. I think it's so true. 
those relationships that we already have are so valuable and we should be using them to our absolute um, potential at the moment. I think it's a very, very good tip and actually one that we can all take away, especially like in our business as well. Um, mm. It's very, very true. Yeah, absolutely. Even though, oh, Aaron, I'm thank sorry, you. I am, I, am, I am still cold calling, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> he's not your boss is not he's not listening this. don't worry right <laughs> um yes uh aaron thank you for being our guest thank you for coming on the show thank you for some recommendations around uh the daily for new york times i imagine over the last couple of weeks that's been particularly interesting and a nice little tip to uh, take your mind off work and make sure that you appear like you're in the loop um we'll go to a quick advert break when we're back we're going to be talking about something that refers to last week's podcasts Ooh. Now that we're officially in the run into Christmas, why not think about giving a gift with a story behind it? Alive and Kicking are using football as a force for good and helping to support mental health education across Africa. You can do the same by giving someone a football from aliveandkicking.org forward slash shop. Now the footballs come in retro 90s kit designs. So go have a look and give a unique gift that will help make a huge difference to more than just the person who receives it this Christmas. Bentley is leading the way to change to batteries. Uh, If we think back to the conversations that we had with Cummins last week, um, Bentley basically have decided that they will cease um, manufacture of all internal combustion engines by 2030, being the first British car maker to make that pledge. Oh, interesting. Well, that's going to be expensive. <laughs> First thing that went suppose, to mind. <laughs> yeah, but if Bentley go down this route, of course, I mean, Bentley are high end, but sure. it's going to push more car makers to Domino do Domino effect, right? absolutely. Because it's that's so forward thinking. It's the next step with all of that sort of yeah. thing, 100%. Yeah, I'm interested to see what happens with that then. How, how exciting. I mean, the thing is, you would have thought... And maybe you'd tell me that I'm wrong here, but you what what was the electric car that you used to sell? Multiple. Um so in Kia. But what was what was the manufacturer? Kia. Kia. So Kia are Or Mitsubishi. Low Okay, but Kia are a bit more lower end entry entry. They're not they're not they're not budget cars, but then certainly they're not top the, end, right? Yeah. Yeah, they're like fine. With and family cars. And stuff like that. Bentley ain't that. No. But I would have thought it would have been like a Fiat that would have kind of, I know, I know they're not British, but something of that kind of standing would have been the first car manufacturer to go, right, cease all production of combustion engine by 2030. And I would have thought that high-end, slightly um, elite cars would have been the last bastion of petrol heads. Sure. And this has proved me wrong. Yeah, no, absolutely. I wouldn't have um, thought that you would have heard it from Bentley either. But it was more of like the the cars that are are really like into that te- in that techie sort of stage and and really utilizing electric vehicles and selling them. You'd think that they were going to be the next ones, but actually, we've been proven wrong. Yeah, oh, I'd love and a Bentley. The, I think well, the inter- the interesting thing here is around the economics and and the scale because the article goes on to say. In you know that that that's the preconception I had, but it's easier for a luxury car maker to go electric than a mass market plant, because um, they have the ability to produce hundreds of thousands of cars a, a year. The mass, sorry, start this sentence again. It's easier for a luxury car maker to go electric than a mass market plants that have the ability to produce hundreds of thousands of cars a year. And that's because Bentley starts at 130,000 and costs well over 240,000, giving it a lot of extra leeway to absorb extra battery costs. Mm-hmm. And they also are obviously predicting that by 2030, production costs for electrics will be lower than fossil fueled cars, making it easy for mass volume players to make the change. Mm. So because well, their cars sense. cost so much. Yeah they can absorb the costs which is yeah i just wouldn't have kind of considered that no no absolutely that makes so much sense though now you're saying it whereas the mass market cars are is down to cost you know they're not trying it's to do margin, anything cheaply it? at all exactly um, and they're on tight margins exactly exactly that so if we want um basically we're all going to be driving um 
Ferrari uh, E-types um, <laughs> by 2027, and they'll cost you no know, more than than a Kia. Wow, that is going to be a really, that that will be a like a Bentley electric. I don't even know if they do an electric vehicle, but one of those that is going to be a serious bit of kit. That would be could be I'm, exciting. Yeah, I'm going to go and look up their concept cars now. <laughs> <laughs> well, they must be out there, right? I, um, and it, it only it only goes to 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 entrench what Amy was telling us from Cummins about now is the time for hydrogen. Now is the you know now is the time. This is. You know, she said in five years' time, let's have another conversation, see where we are. If 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 they are going to have ceased production of all cons com, internal combustion engine by twenty thirty, by twenty twenty five, they're gonna have some some electric cars on the market. Amazing. To be honest with you, most brands do now. Like there are there is I mean, there must only be a few cars, I mean a supercars being obviously one of them, um, that aren't electric. Uh, all brands now have electric alternatives, so it's there. Like the market is there, and it's there to be had. It's just that the it's not pushed enough. They hear about it on the news, yeah. but it's not actually pushed enough for people to see it. You know, so well, the time will tell. I reckon. Watch this space in the next sort of you know five years. We're definitely going to be moving more that way. A hundred percent, which is good news. Yeah, it's good well, look, news. Uh, Haley, thank you for dropping in taking some time out of your thursday yeah. to record today's interview uh we'll be back on tuesday <clears throat> uh but apart from that everyone have a lovely a lovely lockdown weekend if you're in the uk if you're somewhere else just have a normal weekend enjoy I don't